What is up? Welcome to another edition of the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by DraftKings. It's me, your man, MG Marcus Grant, still masking and socially distancing when and where appropriate. We got a big Friday show for you, as we always do. We'll be joined by our pal Michael F. Floria. We'll go over last night's Thursday night game between the Bucks and the Bears. We'll talk some daily fantasy value picks. Also, some of the big questions that we might be looking at for week five. But before we do any of that, we'll talk to our faithful producer, as we always do, senior Edward L. Murphy Esquire. Murph, what's new where you are today? Well, um, I am excited for my fantasy teams this week, uh, obviously. I will say, though, congratulations to you and your Dodgers. And uh, right now, for those watching, I am wearing my New York Yankees t-shirt. Um, this is it. This is why they paid Garrett Cole the boatload of money they they gave him. Uh, he is asking for the ball, and this is it. Game five for all the marbles to move on to the LCS. And I have uh, too much excitement right now at 9:38 a.m. as we were recording, and I'm <laughs> I'm gonna lose my mind. I'm I'm very very excited, but uh, yeah. So the the Giants uh, hurt me. The Yankees give me some hope. That's where I'm at right now. Yeah, I mean, this this really is what it is. This is why the Yankees put this team together for these moments. And I think it's interesting. I, I love the sort of the subplot that it's against the Rays, with whom you know yes. the Yankees have a budding rivalry. Uh, yeah, this should be fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, it should be really interesting to watch. And, and I'll say this, the baseball playoffs have been very great theater. Uh, I will also say, I, totally. I, I don't want this, I don't want this expanded playoffs forever, but for this year, I, I thought it's been, I, I think it's been pretty good theater. I, I cannot agree more, especially because people like to knock baseball and say it's a regional thing. No one really cares, but I do find myself, and I'm sure you have as well with uh, with your series that were going on. Every pitch, you just you're on the edge of your seat, and it, and it really does matter. And it's uh, it's really exciting and a time that we all could could use it. But uh, I could use actually one more win to get us to the next series. Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, look forward to that. And we're looking forward to getting into the rest of week five. And as we always are on Friday, we're joined by our pal Michael F. Florio. Florio, what is new where you are today? Unfortunately, I have not got to enjoy the, fan uh, the baseball playoffs like you and Eddie have. Uh, the Mets, half the teams in the league got to make it. The Mets, unfortunately, couldn't. But uh, I'm rooting for your Dodgers, Marcus. But unfortunately, Eddie, uh, go Rays. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I will say, look, you guys contributed to the pennant race in the fact that, uh, you know, if it wa wasn't for the Mets, I don't know that the Dodgers would have Justin Turner right now. So we do thank you for your contribution. As a fellow Red Beard, I love rooting for Justin <laughs> Turner. But with the Mets, he was a ground ball specialist. So, I mean, enjoy him. He's come a long way. He absolutely has. Uh, it's been it's been a joy to watch. Uh, the baseball playoffs have been fun as well, so we look forward to seeing how that continues uh, as we go along. Uh, let's switch gears, though, here now, and let's talk about some fantasy news that has sort of bled into, or I guess real news that has bled into the fantasy world. We have been tracking, obviously, the COVID situation when it comes to the Tennessee Titans. They did earlier in the week have a another player test positive for COVID-19. Now, as of Friday morning, there were no positive tests the hope is that the Titans could reopen their facility as soon as Saturday. And along those lines, their game against the Buffalo Bills has been moved to Tuesday. That is scheduled for a 7 p.m. Eastern kickoff. Meanwhile, the Patriots have no, they haven't had any more positive tests since Stephon Gilmore. So their game against the Broncos has been moved from Sunday until to Monday. And that one is set to be played at 5 p.m. Eastern. Of course, all of this scheduling is pending uh, no further positive tests from any of the teams involved in this game. So we'll certainly keep an eye on that. I'd say to stay tuned to NFL Network, NFL.com for the latest on all these situations. So we're, we're hoping for the best. We're hoping to get football in. The week may be extended a little longer than we're used to seeing, uh, depending on how things go. But, uh, Florio, I mean, let's talk about this from a fantasy perspective. The Titans specifically – they have some very interesting fantasy pieces. I mean, Derek Henry is is owned in pretty much every league. Uh, you know, Ryan Tannehill has been a nice fantasy quarterback this year. A.J. Brown, I know he's hurt, uh, but he's a guy that people were counting on. John New Smith has played very well. If you have any Titans on your roster, how are you handling this right now? I think it's kind of a player-by-player -player basis. Like, if I have Derek Henry right now, and I don't have a great RB on my bench that I feel confident in starting, I'm going to probably be trying to risk it and get Derrick Henry in my lineup. But now, like, if I have Ryan Tannehill, quarterback is deep enough where I feel like I can go out and get a quarterback, Teddy Bridgewater, Justin Herbert, someone mm -hmm. off the waiver wire, and plug them in this week and not have to worry about it. Yeah, maybe Tannehill ends up, if he plays, ends up scoring a little bit more than those guys, but you don't have to worry about it. You're, it's better than taking a zero 
Jonu Smith is an interesting one because tight end is kind of tight end. But, like, if you – it depends if you want to take that risk or not. If not, like, Ian Thomas is a name on the waiver wire that I think you can grab and plug in. Um, and, and then I will say, though, Marcus, I have a lot of Josh Allen in that game, and I've been grabbing Justin Herbert everywhere that I have Josh Allen because he plays on Monday night, so that is at least another day that I can wait on making that decision if I want to start Allen or not. And I think we'll have – a little bit more of an idea of what's going to happen with that game come Monday night rather than, you know, early Sunday morning. Your point about sort of treating it by position, I think, is a valid one because, uh, as you mentioned, quarterback is deeper. You can go out and find wide receivers. You can find tight ends if you need to. That that Derrick Henry piece is the one that's really going to be hard because – it is literally the last game of the week, and there are no other options. This isn't like a Sunday night game where maybe you can go and you can you know, find somebody playing on Monday night if you need to. Uh, if this game, some, if something happens and this game gets, uh, gets scratched, uh, then you are sort of stuck here. But I do think Derrick Henry is maybe the only guy that you really feel like you're waiting this out and you're waiting to go with. I think just about everybody else on the Titan side, for instance, I think you can sort of kind of work around them. And I think a lot of people on the Bills side, uh, you know, maybe not Josh Allen because he's been so good, but I think a lot of guys <laughs> on the Bills side, you can sort of work around and try to find out some other solutions that you are more certain are going to play, whether it's sometime on Sunday or, uh, or the later game potentially on Monday. That game we know is going to be played, at least right now. The Saints and Chargers is for sure on. There are no questions. There are no worries there. So that's one that we can kind of you know, work around if, if we need to. But this also leads to a bigger question. And I know we talked about sort of COVID strategies before the season, things like expanding your rosters and that sort of deal. But now that we're sort of in the middle of this and we've already seen one game postponed and now we have a couple that are in danger potentially of being postponed, uh, what kind of midseason COVID strategies do you recommend to people right now? I think the there's no perfect answer to this because these cases kind of just pop up and we have to react. But I think that you need to be more proactive than ever this year. This isn't, you know, a normal fantasy season where you can get by just setting waivers on Tuesday, looking at your lineup, you know, before Thursday and before Sunday games kick off. Like, I think you need to be checking NFL.com and Twitter and everything and stay up to date. And the minute something like this happens – you need to start thinking, all right, well, if I don't have this player this week, who can I go out and grab and go out and get that player? Because you don't want to be in a position where, you know, say you had only Josh Allen as your quarterback and now that game's up in the air. You don't want to be like heading into Monday with no other backup quarterback or something like that. So I think once you hear of any player, maybe even potentially being in jeopardy, you have to go out and and get a backup, even if it means cutting someone that you were stashing on your bench or something like that, because you just do not want to take a zero. That's far too valuable in any game. It, it's definitely a thing that you, this is sort of the reason we were very heavy in advocating expanded benches and, you know, just trying to make your rosters as deep as possible, just because we didn't really know what sort of contingencies we were going to have to work around this year. And we're starting to see it a little bit. My only other piece of advice beyond what Florio said is just, understand that not every solution is going to be equitable. And I know that in the past, we have really kind of tried to be fair and, and try to set up situations. And I know the league has tried to set up a creative or a competitive balance situation where everything is equal across the board. This year, I don't think that's going to be possible. I think whatever league rules you have, I think you, you try and accommodate everyone as best as possible. But with things sort of changing by the minute and, and, you know, adjustments being made on the fly, I think it's going to be hard to have every situation be completely equitable for everybody. And I know that's going to be frustrating. I know that, you know, that's a thing that we've seen a lot of people sort of complaining about scheduling and, and the rosters and that sort of thing. And in some ways, I certainly empathize, but uh, it, it just, it's just not going to be possible for everything to be even for everybody this year because, look, uh, we're doing the best we can. I know everybody's sort of doing the best they can. We're also sort of at the mercy of what the league is going to do with these games. And, and until we certainly have those ideas, we can't really you know, make any other, other moves or any other predictions or anything like that. So, uh, hey, look, it's going to be a wild year. It's going to be rough. So we appreciate everybody sort of, you know, take a deep breath, pause, understand this is a game. Uh, I know you're sort of emotionally invested in it, but this is not the, the crux of what is going on in the world right now. 
All right. Uh, let's do something maybe a little bit more pleasant. It's time for Home Field Advantage, presented by Pearl's Place in Chicago. We're helping promote local Black-owned businesses around the nation. So let's dive into this Bucks bears game from last night. And by the way, if you are in Chicago, be sure to check out Pearl's Place for uh, some great down-home Southern cooking. All right. The Bears squeak one out 20 to 19 over the Buccaneers. It was not pretty. Uh, but let's talk about some of the top scores. First, let's let's start on the Buccaneers side. Ronald Jones, 125 scrimmage yards. He had 15 and a half points. Mike Evans, five for 41 and a touchdown. That got you a little more than 15 points. Tom Brady, yeah, he was just kind of uh 253 passing yards with a touchdown, just over 14 points in most scoring formats. So I'm going to ask you this, and I know how you felt about Ronald Jones coming into the season, and I promise you I'm not asking you this to troll you, but in all seriousness, are we ready to start to think that Ronald Jones is taking control of this number one running back situation in Tampa? Yeah, I, I think I have to hold the L on Ronald Jones here. I wasn't a big supporter of his coming into the year. I thought they brought Leonard Fournette in for a reason, but Ronald Jones has really taken over this backfield. and. He has all year outside of week two when he had that fumble and we saw Fournette come in then. Outside of that, it's been Ronald Jones backfield. He's getting more use in the passing game than I ever expected. And he had 125 yards last night, over 15 fantasy points, like you said, Marcus. And he was probably robbed of a touchdown. Mm -hmm. So it could have been a, a much better fantasy night for him. And I don't think it hurts that the other threat right now in the passing game is Keyshawn Vaughn. And he had two targets last night and one of them was a fumble. So... I think right now the arrow is definitely pointing up for Ronald Jones. I look, I, I thought Ronald Jones was going to have a, a decent season. I certainly didn't foresee the Leonard Fournette situation. I still think that when Fournette comes back, when he's when he's fully healthy, I know he was there sort of as an emergency piece if they needed him last night, but when he's fully healthy, he is going to get on the field. He's going to get some touches. So it, it's it's always it's not always going to be this good for Ronald Jones, but I do think that they like him as their lead running back. I mean, that was the thing Bruce Arian said coming into the season, that Rojo is our guy, and we're going to go with him. And so far, they seem to have stuck to that. And by the way, I still contend that that fumble in week two, I think that was as much or more the fault of Tom Brady not putting the ball where he should have uh, than it was. You know, now, obviously, if it comes down to who's going to catch the blame, Ronald Jones versus Tom Brady, <laughs> sorry, Rojo, you're going to lose that battle every time. Uh, but watching that, I do think that, that Brady has some fault there. So uh, maybe maybe this has been a little bit of redemption for him. Uh, as for Mike Evans, mentioned the line, 5 for 41 and a touchdown. Uh, I, you know, I, I wish I had it pulled up, but I know uh, Chris Towers at, at CBS Sports sort of extrapolated what uh, his season-ending totals could be. And the gist of it is the receptions and the yardage totals weren't great. It was actually fewer than 900 yards. But he's on pace for 19 touchdowns. How do we value this? Is he having a good fantasy season? I mean, what, what do we make of Mike Evans right now? So I'll start off by saying I was completely avoiding Evans in drafts coming into the year. And outside of the touchdowns, so far, everything that I thought we'd see from Evans has kind of come true. Like his catches and targets are down this year. His yardage is down this year, but he's making up for it by becoming the Jordan Howard of wide receivers. He has... <laughs> Four, I believe it's four touchdowns of two yards, or maybe it's even five now, two or yards or less this season. So I don't see that. Like, he has 22 catches and six touchdowns. That's over 25% of his catches for a touchdown. I don't foresee him being able to keep up that pace. So with the if I'm expecting the touchdowns to come down, and then you have Chris Godwin who's going to come back, there's going to be more work for targets there. I actually think Mike Evans right now, if I have him, I'm looking to sell high on him. I would agree with that. And here's the here's the the on pace stats. He's on pace for 70 catches, 867 yards, and 19 touchdowns, which is bonkers to think about because, like, like I said, the the reception number, the yardage numbers, they're not great. They're fine. Uh, the touchdown number is ridiculous, and so that makes it hard to value. And I always like to say touchdowns are fickle beasts, right? Like right now, he is scoring in bulk. But as you mentioned, the, the rate at which he is scoring touchdowns, it just doesn't seem sustainable over the course of a full season. Factor in that at some point, Chris Godwin is going to come back and he's going to get some of those opportunities as well. So Mike Evans, it might be a sell high situation. If there's somebody who needs wide receiver help, maybe you put Mike Evans out there and expect at some point for him to come back down to earth a little bit, unless 
somehow the page or the uh, the Patriots, the Buccaneers decide to start using him uh, between the twenties a little bit more. Uh, on the other side for the Bears, Allen Robinson went out and, and did Allen Robinson things. Ten catches for ninety yards. Uh, after the game, he actually tweeted, "I'm going to be better." And I'm like, "You know, a Rob, it's not your fault. You're not the reason that this offense uh, is so inconsistent." David Montgomery, 59 scrimmage yards, uh, seven catches and a touchdown for him. He had almost 19 fantasy points. Jimmy Graham, three for 31 and a touchdown. And uh, look, I know after the game, Matthew Berry tweeted that not enough people are talking about Jimmy Graham. And I'm like, hey, you're not listening to our podcast because we're talking about him. <laughs> and by the way, for people out there, don't go snitch tagging Matthew Berry in this. This is all in fun. <laughs> I'm not taking any shots at him. Uh, Cause I just, I know that's, what's going to happen, right? Like the clip will get out there. He'll get snitch tag and it'll be a whole thing. It's not, it's just not supposed to be a thing. I'm having some fun, but, but we have been talking about Jimmy Graham, but the guy I really want to talk about is David Montgomery because seven catches this week, six targets last week without Tariq Cohen, he actually is becoming a part of the passing game. So when, when you do rankings and stuff going forward, what are you doing with David Montgomery? Yeah, I think David Montgomery going forward has to be valued as an RB2 with upside every week. And before this, like, he was always one of those backs that, like, he'd come in, like, the 20 through 30 range. Like, that's, you know, being a low-end RB2 or a flex option. But his weekly floor is so much higher now with Tariq Cohen out. If he's going to be seeing six or eight targets every game, like, last night, 59 scrimmage yards. That is not a great game by any stretch. But he still gave you nearly 20 fantasy points because of those seven catches and that touchdown. So if he's going to get, you know, five, six, seven free points each week off of catches, that raises his floor so much that I think he needs to be valued as an RB2 every single week. I was skeptical about what his role was going to be after Tariq Cohen got hurt because he just hadn't been a guy they were targeting in the passing game, you know, in the early part of his career. So I really thought that was going to go somewhere else, whether... You know, whether it's going to be Ryan Nall, who really just can't get on the field right now, whether it was going to be Cordero Patterson, who we've sort of seen used in bits and pieces there. I just figured that David Montgomery's role was going to stay the same. And in an offense that struggles to score consistently, it wasn't something that really excited me. But if this is how they're going to use him, not only did they throw him the ball, Florida, they threw him the ball in key situations late in the game. I mean, that little teardrop that, that uh, he got from Nick Foles, that was in the fourth quarter on what ended up being the game-winning drive. So they're trusting to throw the ball to him in really important situations. So that really does change my evaluation. And, and maybe it gets me sort of back on the bandwagon because I was, I was on the bandwagon last year and was left disappointed. So maybe this has me back on board with, with David Montgomery. I still think he is at best an RB2 because of that offense. But I, yeah. I think there's more reasons to be, be excited. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't – he's not an every week start, though, is he? He's still a matchup-based play in those situations, right? Yeah, I think in the tough matchup weeks, I'll probably have him lower back to, like, that range, that high flex range maybe. But I think more weeks than not, I will say, I think he'll be in play if he's getting pass game usage like this. Because to your point, Marcus, like, that over – like, that downfield throw over the shoulder catch, like, that was not an easy – catch to make and he made that play and he had a few runs where he like changed direction I don't know last night I just felt like he was playing a little bit looser than we've kind of seen him play in the past maybe maybe it's that added confidence maybe they they have you know <laughs> let him know that that this is his job and, and he's gonna get more maybe, maybe that's all it takes who knows at the wide receiver spot there has been a brewing battle and I guess it's only brewing if you're really, really, if you're a Bears fan or if you're a, a fantasy diehard like us who are looking into these sorts of things. But between Anthony Miller and Darnell Mooney. Now, yesterday, neither one really did a whole lot. Mooney ended up having more snaps than Miller. Miller ended up having more targets and catches than Mooney. But we have seen a growing rise of Nick Mooney or Daryl Mooney. I'm looking at this Nick Foles video and I've been talking about Darnell <laughs> Mooney. Uh, I mean, is this a guy worth thinking about? Should we be considering Darnell Mooney? Or is this just a situation where really it's just Allen Robinson, Jimmy Graham, and, and nobody else? Yeah, I think it is a situation where it's Allen Robinson getting all the targets. So you, you want to use him. Jimmy Graham is getting the use near the, the in the end zone. So you want to use him. And then that's really it. I think what Mooney does more than help himself is hurt Anthony Miller. Uh, Miller is someone I was excited about coming into the year. But with Mooney getting the usage that he is, it's just not looking like it's going to happen for Miller. So I think 
it's more of avoid both of those two than it is get Mooney into your lineup or anything like that. What's frustrating about it to me is that I sort of liked Anthony Miller as a deep sleeper coming into the year. I, there were a few leagues where I drafted him sort of, you know, if not my last pick, maybe my second to last pick, just hoping that maybe something happens. And early in the year, I thought maybe something was was budding there. But now with Mooney coming in there, it doesn't mean like – I think you're right. This doesn't mean Darnell Mooney is a thing. I think it means that you know, he and Anthony Miller are both going to sort of cannibalize each other, and neither one of them is going to be consistently usable in fantasy, especially in a passing game that that really struggles to, to generate a, a whole lot of excitement on a week-to-week basis. All right, that was Home Field Advantage presented by Pearl's Place. By the way, today's show is sponsored by DraftKings, the leader in one-day fantasy sports. DraftKings has millions of dollars in total prizes up for grabs this week. So download the DraftKings app now. Use code TEAM and sign up and start feeling the sweat like never before. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Hit the break. Come back. We will talk about the big questions we are looking at for week five. Is Teddy Bridgewater a guy you need to have in your lineup? Stick around for that on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. Time to dig into some of the big questions that we are facing as we go headlong into the bulk of week five coming up on Sunday. And one of the bigger news stories of the week was the change in Houston, head coach, general manager, play caller, and uh, ruler of the hallway, I guess. Uh, Bill O'Brien has been let go there in Houston. And the you know, there are certainly questions about this offense and wondering what you know, what was going on with the play calling, why this offense wasn't scoring more points than it was. So now the Texans are free of Bill O'Brien. What do we expect from this offense this week, Florio? Is it bad that I expect them to come out and just like click on all cylinders? Like I think they're gonna just come out <laughs> firing and you're not alone. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a lot of like evidence in that. Like the Jaguars are are not a great defense. They are a good matchup for a lot of these Texans players, especially in the run game. But it just seems like one of those situations where the head coach is gone, and and it didn't seem like he was super popular with the players. And now uh, Deshaun Watson is just going to come out and set the world on fire. I agree. I think what you see a lot of times in these situations when you have a head coaching change is. Whoever comes in next, and especially if there's a change at play caller or offensive coordinator, usually the person who comes in next decides to keep it sort of simple and basically just put the ball in the hands of their best player and let that player go out and make plays. And in this case, uh, it's it's Deshaun Watson. And, and you know, I mean, you, you sort of look at what's going on, right? I mean, last year, the, the Texans were scoring about 23 and a half points a game. That's down to 20 points. Uh, they're down in total yards, about, you know, almost 35 yards per game. Uh, rushing yards are down significantly, almost about 50 rushing yards per game uh, this year versus last year. So I think right now it's just the, the, the Texans need to sort of push reset on everything. I think what like we have seen in Seattle where the Seahawks has, have decided to let Russ cook. I, I think the Texans are going to go out and let Deshaun Watson do his thing and, and let him be great, which is nice because I've got Deshaun Watson in a couple of leagues. So I would love to see him just sort of get unleashed and do his thing. But But I'm with you. I think there's no empirical way to sort of you know predict this thing it's just kind of a a feeling and having watched football for a while and just seeing how these things work this feels like the texans are going to turn some things around maybe the other question by the way just quickly maybe this means they're not going to force feed david johnson as much i felt like maybe they were trying to prove a point and so do we start to de-emphasize david johnson in our lineups if we haven't already i think a little bit I, i'm actually Duke Johnson is someone I have a little bit more interest in too. Like I wrote about him in the sleeper article this week. I think that Bill O'Brien, he traded DeAndre Hopkins away for David Johnson. There was that, you know, that he owed David Johnson. It felt like, like he needed to feed him so that David Johnson could put up good numbers to kind of warrant making that trade. But now O'Brien is gone. So they don't owe Duke, uh, David Johnson that. And we already saw Duke Johnson last week returned, play about 40% of the snaps. We saw him get used in the passing game. So with Bill O'Brien gone now and there not being that allegiance to David Johnson, I think that his weekly touches could go down and Duke Johnson's could go up. And that would, I think, be amazing for fantasy Twitter because the one thing they always complain about is why Duke Johnson has not gotten an opportunity to be a three down back yet. 
David Johnson getting about 15 touches a week. I wouldn't be surprised if you see that number get down closer to 10. Uh, and as much as I love Duke Johnson, I feel like everywhere he's gone, he's had the same problem. He's a good running back, but he's been on teams with better running backs. And he's a good receiver, but he's always been on teams with better receivers. And so that has sort of capped, I think, his, his fantasy production, unfortunately. But we'll see. Maybe things turn around for him there. Teddy Bridgewater has quietly, I think, had a very good season in Carolina. I know for fantasy, he hasn't really raised any eyebrows, but coming into the week, he was sixth in total passing yards in the NFL. The problem was he had just four touchdowns. He gets a great matchup with the Falcons this week. So what are you projecting for Teddy Two Gloves? I have Teddy Two Gloves as a top 12 quarterback this week because the Falcons are just, like you said, Marcus, he's been playing pretty well and the Falcons are just that get right game for everyone so far this year. And the touchdowns have been the one issue for Teddy Bridgewater. Well, the Falcons have allowed more passing touchdowns than any team this year. They're allowing over 32 fantasy points per game to quarterbacks, and they've allowed a quarterback to score 29 fantasy points in every single game this year, except for one. It was against the Bears where they pulled Mitchell Trubisky, but if you combine Nick Foles and Trubisky's fantasy points that week, it's just under 29. So I think this is as good of a matchup as you can get for a quarterback. And Teddy, like if you're worried about Josh Allen or Ryan Tannehill or any of those guys, Pick up Teddy off the waiver wire and start. Absolutely. He should be one of the top streaming options this week. You, you mentioned the quarterbacks that we're sort of waiting on and not sure about. Also, the fact that Aaron Rodgers is on a bye. Matthew Stafford is on a bye. So there is a need for quarterbacks this week. I, I think, Todd, Teddy Bridgewater is uh, maybe one of the best options you can have. And, and the Falcons have given up 13 passing touchdowns, most in the league so far. So if that's the one thing that Teddy has been lacking, this is an opportunity for him to get healthy in that category. On the other side of that game, Todd Gurley has sort of been kept afloat by his ability to score touchdowns. I think that's what's helped him over the last couple of years, fantasy-wise. But he gets a great matchup in Carolina. I know they shut down Kenyon Drake last week, but I'm putting that aside. What are your expectations for Todd Gurley? I feel kind of gross saying this, but I have Todd Gurley as my RB12 this week. And Todd Gurley hasn't had 90 scrimmage yards in a game yet this season, but he does have five touchdowns. And the Panthers have already allowed the, they're tied with the Raiders for most touchdowns allowed to running backs this season. That's after allowing by far the most to the position in 2019. So I think there's a clear recipe for success of running backs against the Panthers, not including Kenyon Drake, but Todd Gurley, like you said, Marcus, the touchdowns of what saved his season. I would not be, I expect him to score a touchdown this week, and I would not be surprised if he scored twice. But I will say that after this game against the Panthers, I think I would be looking to sell high because if he has a good game, that's two strong games in a row, even though it's been weak matchups. But your opponent, your, whoever you're trading with, doesn't need to know that. So go out and try to trade Todd Gurley high, I think, if he has a good game this week. Agree completely there. Yeah, I, every week we keep saying, yeah, I mean, Gurley had a good game, but, you know, if you take away the touchdowns, at some point we have to start, we have to stop saying the if you took away the touchdowns because he keeps scoring touchdowns every week. But I guess at the same time, and I know I'm sort of double speaking here, I, I don't want to live on that razor's edge of having to count on those touchdowns each and every week because the yardage totals aren't great. And, and the thing that I thought would happen, which was the Falcons would integrate him more into the passing game, that's not happening. And so what what little hope I had that maybe he could sort of rebound a little bit, that seems to be going away. Just sort of weird in an offense that has to throw the football a lot, but that really is the case. So Todd Gurley, I think you, you play him this week. If you can move him after that, that is probably the best course of action. The Giants offense has been not great. Uh, that's to, to put it mildly so far. I mean, they have what, three touchdowns, I think, in their first four games, which is sort of hard to do in the modern NFL. But here we are. They get the Cowboys this week, and the Cowboys' defense has been about as bad as it can be. Uh, the fact that the Cowboys score a lot of points means that the other team has to score a lot to keep up with it. So what would you do with any Giants players that you have on your roster this week? I think this is the week that you got to start them. Like, I'm not saying use Daniel Jones in a one-quarterback league, but I think if you're in a two-quarterback or super flex or playing DFS, that Daniel Jones is someone you should keep an eye on or and, and should be very much so on your radar. He's been running more. And I think this is a game where he's going to be able to pass better because like you said, Marcus, their defense has been, of the Cowboys has been really bad. And the Giants' first four games were against pretty tough defenses. I think Darius Slayton is a boomer bust wide receiver three this week, but I like his chances of going boom. And I have Evan Ingram in a couple of leagues. I, I 
was tempted to let him go earlier in the season, but this is the game like I, I've been waiting for. I'm going to give him the opportunity this week. If they flop this week, then I think we got to reevaluate this Giants offense and if we could even trust any of them. But I do like a lot of their players for fantasy this week. Very much for me, a make or break week for a guy like Evan Ingram. Uh, if, if it doesn't happen this week, then I just don't know. And in some ways, maybe not as, as seriously, but Daniel Jones, who I thought was sort of a sleeper, a guy that I was taking late in drafts, uh, in a lot of places, just expecting that something maybe good would happen. I, it, this is not a make or break. Like if 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 it doesn't happen this week, I think I can you know you can drop Daniel Jones and not feel so bad about it. I mean it was it was an experiment and it didn't work, but this is a chance to see what the Giants can do. I do think in deeper leagues, Devontae Freeman is a nice option this week just to see if he can sort of get going now that he's had some some practice time under his belt there with with the Giants offense, but. I, it is a situation where you really are streaming these players. This is the opportunity to get them in your lineup. There won't be maybe a lot of these coming up just because of the way they've played, but this is, I think, a chance for, for everybody to sort of take advantage. In the division, uh, at least partially in that division, you got the Washington football team, which has been very good defensively, not so good offensively. They've made a change at quarterback. Dwayne Haskins is not only not the starter, he's the number three guy. So the depth chart now goes Kyle Allen, Alex Smith, and Dwayne Haskins, but that defense has been good. They're playing the Rams, who the defense is not bad. The offense has left something to be desired. Who, if anyone, do you trust in your lineup in this Rams FT game? I think it's the wide receivers, and that's probably about it. Like, I think you with the two teams on by and the other games potentially up in the air, I don't think this is a week to get away from Cooper Cup or Robert Woods, despite. Uh, not, you know, really, I don't think they've lived up to expectations so far this season, but the, the Rams are running the ball the third most in the league so far this year, which is hurting their pass catchers, but they've been so inconsistent with their RB usage, and now Cam Akers is coming back this week too, that I don't really want to start any of them, and I have all of their backs as flex options or lower, and then on the, for Washington, it's Terry McLaurin, right? Like, I think Terry McLaurin is matchup proof. It's just, for me, it was just a matter of, can Dwayne Haskins get him the ball? But we saw last year that Kyle Allen was able to turn DJ Moore into a top 15 wide receiver. And I think uh, McLaurin's even better than him. So I, I start McLaurin every week. Uh, and then I think Antonio Gibson is actually someone that is becoming a RB2 in fantasy right now. But outside of that, you play the Rams defense and that's it. I, I know that you're not the, the only person who has made the Kyle Allen, DJ Moore analogy. And I think that's kind of the best thing we have to hold on to as the reason to believe in McLaurin. I do think Gibson's usage is starting to become a little more encouraging. And I like the fact that he catches the football. I mean, he was a hybrid player in college. And the fact that Washington is using him as such means that even if they are playing from behind, He's not quite as likely to come off the field, so I certainly agree with that. I'm with you. I'm staying completely away from the Rams running backs. Unless I am in dire straits uh, at the running back position or a flex spot, I I'm not playing any of those Rams running backs because the matchup is bad and there are potentially three guys that they're going to cycle through. I mean, last week they, they did a split between Malcolm Brown and Daryl Henderson, and neither one got into a rhythm and neither one produced. It didn't make sense. Now they're going to throw Cam Akers back into the mix, so I, I want no parts of that. So uh, you're probably right. I think it's just the receivers. I'm hoping maybe something good for Bobby Trees, but I, I will tell you that I do have a little bit of, of apprehension. But I'm going to fire him up, at least as a wide receiver, too, in some leagues, and, and hope for the best. Hopefully maybe he, he finds his way into the end zone at some point during the game. If you want more of this kind of analysis, be sure to check out uh, check us out, me and Florio and Adam Rank and Kimmy Checks on NFL Fantasy Game Day. That's on Sunday mornings. We kick that off at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. You can find it streaming on NFL.com, in the NFL Fantasy app, and on YouTube at YouTube.com slash NFL Fantasy Football. In fact, on the YouTube side, we've got Michael F. Florio there answering all your questions. I know he is uh, just grinding away at that for about an hour or so before he goes, not enough, about 45 minutes before he comes and joins us on the show. So uh, if you haven't jumped on, please jump on. It's a good chance to get some of your questions answered in real time before the games start. Take a break, come back, and we will look at some of our best value picks. If you are playing DFS, maybe some ways to sort of get more bang for your fantasy bucks. Stick around for more of the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by DraftKings. Wow. 
It's time for Best Value presented by DraftKings, trying to help you make some economical but wise decisions for your daily fantasy lineup. We'll go through the main positions here. So, Florio, start us off. Quarterback, where are you looking? Yeah, we were talking about him earlier, but it's Teddy Bridgewater, right? Like, you could save a good amount of money at 5900 this week, and it's a great matchup against the Falcons. They've allowed more fantasy points, more touchdowns to quarterbacks than anyone. And their offense, you know, they put up – a good amount of points each week so i think the panthers will have to score to keep up with them i like teddy a lot this week i, I think teddy bridgewater is an excellent pick i'm gonna go with Kirk cousins who also has the same salary at 5900 this week and, and cousins and the vikings have a very good matchup against the seattle seahawks there's one thing we have learned through the first month plus of the season is that you can start your receivers and your quarterbacks against the seattle defense in part because russell and the offense are putting up so many points I think the Vikings are going to have to throw the football to stay in this one. Not many chances I think you're going to want to use Kirk Cousins, but this is one of those that you can get him into your lineup. Uh, all right, over to the running back spot. Uh, who are you looking at for a running back? A, a, a familiar name has crept back in. A familiar but maybe forgotten name lately. It's Le'Veon Bell at 5,100. I think that... I know it's kind of gross right now to want to trust any of the Jets, especially with Joe Flacco at the quarterback. But I will say if there's ever a week, I think it's this one against the Cardinals. The Cardinals have allowed the seventh most fantasy points per game to running backs and the third most receiving yards per game to the position. And that's where I think Le'Veon Bell could have a nice day. I think that the, they're not going to ask Joe Flacco to throw the downfield much. I think there's going to be a lot of short little dump offs to Lev Bell. And he could have maybe a type of game like David Montgomery had where he doesn't have a lot of yards, but he has a lot of catches and maybe he scores a touchdown. If there's a jet you can trust, it's going to be Le'Veon Bell. I'm going to go Todd Gurley. We talked about him in the last segment and, and what uh, he's doing there in the Falcons offense and the matchup he has against the Carolina Panthers. This is one of those games where I could certainly see him getting in the end zone a couple of times. I don't expect necessarily a huge yardage total just because of how the Falcons use him, but it's that touchdown upside. And uh, just a reminder, this is also sort of a, a note of how Todd Gurley has sort of fallen in fantasy. I mean, that, that he's coming in as a value pick now at a $5,100 salary, but this is an opportunity, I think, to get him in your lineup and maybe go big in some other spots. Uh, wide receiver. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about the Steelers. I mean, I know they've been on a a forced buy, but I feel like we haven't talked a lot about the Steelers passing game this year. Yeah, I don't think we have either. And it's just been kind of steady. Like Big Ben hasn't had like a huge game by any stretch, but he's still giving you 18 or more points every game and multiple passing touchdowns. And I think that bodes well for Deontay Johnson, who... I know we like to value Juju as their wide receiver one and the fantasy production so far because Juju has the touchdowns indicates that he is. But it's Deontay Johnson that leads that team in target share and air yard share. So I think that the opportunity is there for him to have a big game every week. And I know the Eagles on paper don't look like a great matchup for wide receivers. They're kind of middle of the pack so far this year. But I think through the air is still the way to attack that defense and because their strength is at stopping the run game. I think what will help the Steelers as well to help their offense is the fact that I think their defense is going to give Philadelphia problems and maybe give them a few extra possessions. I'm going to go with Darius Slayton in this one. And we talked about the Giants in their matchup against the Cowboys. Slayton, 4,800 on DraftKings this week. So you're talking about a great value if you want to go bigger, maybe at some of the other wide receiver spots. This feels like a game where he should get targeted a lot from Daniel Jones. And if the Giants want to stay in this one, which could be a potentially high scoring game, they're going to have to get the ball downfield. And Slayton is the guy that they want to get the ball to. And this is just one of those matchups where I think we're sort of hoping, even in, in more traditional leagues, uh, to get Darius Slayton going. So this is a chance maybe for a little investment to get a pretty big return. So as we switch to tight ends, I guess we stay with the big blue theme, correct? Yeah, I like your Slayton call. And at tight end, I'm going to go with Evan Ingram. He saw you know, his most targets last week. That, that was a big step forward, I think, getting as much work in the passing game as he saw. And then the Cowboys have been beat by tight ends this year. They're allowing the seventh most fantasy points to the position. And like we said earlier, I think that the Giants are going to be forced to throw to keep up with this Cowboys high-powered offense. So I think there's going to be opportunity there for Evan Ingram. I will say, though, Marcus, I like your pick even better than mine. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, my pick of tight end is going to be Hunter Henry because uh, I have a renewed level of confidence in Hunter Henry and, you know, to an extent, Keenan Allen, because we know that Justin Herbert is going to be the starting quarterback for the Los Angeles Chargers for the remainder of the season. 
this is a game that certainly on paper looks like an opportunity for the Charger passing game against a Saints defense that has been uneven for much of the year. So uh, to get Hunter Henry to slot him in at 4,300 and to potentially get some production in what is a fairly limited passing game there uh, for the Chargers seems like a, a really good chance here. So, uh, all right, so that brings us to our defense. Uh, I feel like there was really only one choice, so I will let you go and, and talk about our, the defense this week. It's the Arizona Cardinals. The New York Jets have been the offense to pick on all year this year. It looks like we saw last week the, the pick sixes uh, that the Broncos had against that the, the Jets offense. And I'm um, sorry, the Jets had the pick sixes, but we saw the multiple turnovers that the Jets have had. They just haven't been scoring a lot of points. And now it's Joe Flacco making the start, not even Sam Darnold. There's nothing to be excited about in this Jets offense. Use your Arizona Cardinals. I'm going to double down on that and go with the Cardinals this week. Like I said, it, it felt like the only real option uh, to pick for fantasy defenses this week. Everything about this says the Cardinals are in for a smash opportunity. So that that is one that seems almost predetermined. Uh, so that's that's the, the easy call there. That's what we both went to. And that was Best Value presented by DraftKings. Stick around for more of the NFL Fantasy Football Show after this. One person's fight is never one person's fight. It takes all of us to fight cancer. Join the NFL and the American Cancer Society in the fight today by talking to your doctor or reminding a loved one about getting screened. Visit NFL.com slash Crucial Catch to learn more. Time for our best of the pack presented by Panini Trading Cards. We take three cards out of a pack every week. We find the guys we think are the best and we talk about them. It's just that simple. So as I dig through the pack this week, the first name that comes up is it's Tyler Lockett for the Seattle Seahawks. The Seahawks, their main two wide receivers have been great all year long. He and DK Metcalf have been on smash mode pretty much every week. But how do you rank Lockett, say this week, in comparison to DK Metcalf? I have them both as top 10 wide receivers, um, I, and it, I've been kind of switching which one I have higher of the two each week, but they're both always wide receiver ones right now. The way that Russell Wilson is playing, the connection that he has with Tyler Lockett is unquestioned, and, and DK is looking like one of the best deep threats in all of football, and we know Russ is one of the best deep ball throwers. They're both wide receiver ones, and I know Tyler Lockett let some people down last week, but don't even think about taking them out of your lineup. Continue to start these guys every single week. They're doing it in different ways. You mentioned DK Metcalf is sort of the deep threat. Lockett is the guy who gets more targets, and he's the guy they tend to look for more in the red zone. So uh, they're both produ producing well. They're both guys you want to have in your lineup every week. I have seen some rosters that have both Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. I would really suggest trading one of them just because that's a headache that I don't think I want. Like, I don't know if I feel great about starting both of them each and every week, but I also don't want to have to be forced to choose between them. So if you can find a way to deal one and maybe get something back to strengthen your roster elsewhere, that is something that I would I would highly recommend. Uh, all right, next one up is Steelers quarterback Ben Roethlisberger. And we were just talking about that Steeler passing game earlier in the show. Uh, what do you project for him this week against the Eagles? I think Big Ben is just going to keep being steady Big Ben, right? Like somewhere between 18 and 22 fantasy points is really where he has sat all year. And I think that's where I'm expecting him to sit again this year. Somewhere between like 250, 300 passing yards, two touchdowns, maybe a third. But I think, I don't know if we're going to ever get that ultimate, like, you know, 40 point game like we used to get out of Big Ben, but he just seems like a really steady option each week right now. I think it will happen at some point. I don't think it's going to happen this week. I'm sort of with you. I think this will be a, a fine game. If, if you get somewhere between, you know, 18 to, to 22 points from, from Ben Roethlisberger this week, I think you should be happy with that. The blow-up game is coming. We'll see it at some point in the season, but this is a week where he's just going to be fine. He's just going to be steady. He, I don't think there's going to be any weeks that he really just lays a huge egg and, and destroys your roster. Um, but maybe him as the top three fantasy quarterback, you know, overall is probably not going to happen like we've seen in past seasons. All right, last one. It is got another Tyler. What Tyler Lockett? Now we're going Tyler Boyd with the Cincinnati Bengals. He's obviously the wide receiver one in Cincinnati, but has he reached overall fantasy wide receiver one status yet? 
For me, I still value him more as a wide receiver too, but I will say I am treating this week as kind of like a barometer week for the Bengals. Like if Joe Burrow goes out against the Ravens defense and has a, a good game and Tyler Boyd continues to give us around 20 fantasy points, then I think those are guys that you start every single week and you don't question it. But for right now, I think that this week is a big test to see what this Bengals offense is really made of. I have him just outside of the top 12. I think I've got him around 14 or 15 right now, but he is moving up. The way the Bengals are throwing the football has a lot to do with it. The fact that Joe Burrow's throwing the ball about 45, 46 times per game means that there's a ton of passing volume. It will probably be like that all year because that defense is going to give up a lot of points. And Boyd has easily established himself as the number one wide receiver there. So he's the guy who's going to get most of those looks. So I'm with you. If things continue to progress and if they go out and have a decent offensive game uh, against the Ravens uh, this week, then maybe we start talking about Tyler Boyd as kind of a fringe wide receiver one going forward for the rest of the season. And that was the best of the pack presented by Panini Trading Cards. Stay tuned for more of the NFL Fantasy Football Show after this. Inspired by ongoing conversations with players, the NFL, NFL Players Association, and Players Coalition together launched NFL Votes to empower and improve our communities through exercising the right to vote. Join the NFL family by registering to vote today and make your voice heard this November. Visit NFL.com votes to learn more. All right, this week on Ask a Nerd, we pose the question to our own Matt Okada about the top five tight end fantasy seasons we've ever seen. Thank you, Marcus, and welcome back to everyone else. Today, we're taking a look at the greatest fantasy seasons by a tight end in NFL history. Starting at number five, we have a name the younger crowd may not even recognize, Todd Christensen. Way back in 1983, Christensen snagged 92 catches for 1,200 yards and 12 touchdowns for the Raiders, good for 288.7 fantasy points. At number four is a name we've definitely all heard, Jimmy Graham. Graham scored 294 fantasy points in 2011 on the back of 99 catches, 1,300 yards, and 11 TDs, helping to solidify the stereotype that basketball players make the best tight ends. Our number three tight end is currently 2020's number one tight end, Travis Kelsey. In Kelsey's first full year with Patrick Mahomes in 2018, he racked up 103 catches, 1,300 yards, and 10 scores to barely top Graham with 294.6 fantasy points. Fortunately for Graham, he leapfrogs Kelsey for his second appearance on our list at number two. In 2013, Graham hit 303.5 fantasy points, thanks primarily to a whopping 16 touchdowns. But come on, what kind of list would this be without Rob Gronkowski? Gronk spiked his way to number one on our list in 2011 thanks to 1,300 yards and a tight end record 17 touchdowns obliterating the competition with 330.9 fantasy points. Yo soy fiesta. That's it for this week on Ask a Nerd. I'm Matt Okada, and may the fantasy points be with you. Thank you, Matt. Always great to uh, hear from our resident nerd. I will say I was surprised that Gronk only made the list one time. I was really, I really thought that he would have made a couple of appearances there. Uh, also surprised to see Todd Christensen, like going in the Wayback Machine, uh, to see Todd Christensen there. We didn't get to see his great curls uh, that he had under his helmet, but, but always was, was fun to watch him play when I was a kid. Uh, let's talk about those some tight ends from this season. Now that we are you know, into week five, who has been maybe the biggest surprise at tight end for you? Yeah, there's two names that jump out there for me. One is Jimmy Graham. And again, you know, don't snitch tag Matthew Berry, but Marcus and I have been as <laughs> As my dog tries to run into the shot, uh, Marcus and I have been talking about Jimmy Graham. I feel like every single week on this show, he has become the Bears' top red zone option this year and is someone that I think you have to value as a almost a top 12 tight end every week because if he scores a touchdown, he's going to do well. And the other is uh, is Big Rob Tanyan. Like, Tanyan, uh, he's playing really well there. And the reason I was out on... Packers tight ends was because like Aaron Rodgers has never made them fantasy relevant even when he had Jimmy Graham but it looks like he's found one that he can you know really rely on his targets catches touchdowns 
fantasy points have increased in every game in the last three weeks. I think those are the two biggest ones for me as well, Graham and Tanya. And I will say I, I have some mild surprise that Darren Waller has kept up his production to the level that, that he has. I felt like the Raiders would spread the ball around more, but maybe it's because you know Henry Ruggs has been hurt and they, they haven't really had their, their full complement of pass catchers. Uh, also, a little bit surprised at how well Noah Fant has done. I thought maybe there were some big things coming from him, but I think he's exceeded my expectations this year. So you know that has been a, a very pleasant surprise there. On the flip side, who were you completely wrong about at tight end? One, I'm still a little hopeful on, but so far it's just been a one-week thing. It's Tyler Higby. He had that huge three-touchdown game, but he's being asked to block more this year, running less routes, so I'm very concerned about him. And the other is Gronk. Like, I thought Gronk could come in and get 700 yards this year, and which – historically over the last five years says he would be a tight end one then but he's not even on pace we're five games in now he's not even on pace for 450 yards I don't see any reason to really even hold on to him right now in fantasy my my big disappointment has been Hayden Hurst I thought he was going to slot right into that space that Austin Hooper left vacant in a high volume passing game and see a whole lot of work it hasn't happened uh he had the game what last week I think it was or two weeks ago he had one catch one yard one touchdown the infamous 7.1 game, uh, as Adam Rank dubbed it. <laughs> I, I thought more was coming from him. It just hasn't happened. I have been frustrated because I, I, I really took a lot of shots at him in a lot of drafts. Who knows? Maybe things turn around, but the early returns of it have not been promising. Okay, that is it. We are done. We appreciate you hanging out with the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by DraftKings. You know the drill. Tell two friends to tell two friends. Rate, review, and remember... Only the mediocre are always at their best. Be safe, take care of yourselves, wear a mask, and we will see you on Monday.